So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here and welcome to the um, JKMRC Friday seminar series. Um, on behalf of the Queensland, on the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians of the land on which we meet today. We bow our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country and we recognize the valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So it's my great, great pleasure today to welcome Will Mosley. Um, Will is the Chief Commercial Officer at, at Ray Gen, an Australian technology company backed by SLB, Chevron, Equinor, AGL, and Arena. He leads strategic partnerships, techno-economic modeling, fundraising, and project development. Um, prior to Ray Jane, Will worked at McKinsey and, Con and Company, and he has a in mechanical engineering degree, uh, majoring in thermodynamics, and Will worked for a year as a mobile, mobile crusher operator at the iron ore mine Yari in Western Australia, and he's also the grandson of Prof. Alban Lynch, who, as all of you know, was the very first director of JKMRC. Um, today's title will be, the title of his talk will be Mining the Energy Transition for Opportunities. Please join me in welcoming Will. Excellent, and thank you for the introduction, Christy. Um, also, I'd like to pay my acknowledgement to the traditional owners. Um, just a little bit about me before I get going. So, as you heard, um, I work at Raygen. It's a new approach to solar and storage. We're backed by Schlumberger, Chevron, Equinor, AGL, and Arena, and we're operating the world's largest long-duration energy storage project globally at 50 megawatt hours or 17 hours. Um, today's talk actually won't be about Raygen, so if you do have questions about this technology, I'm happy to kind of go into it later. Um, what I am going to sort of talk about more is a broader perspective of the energy transition and coming at it from sort of my workplace, which is sort of really in deep in um, grid scale and also off-grid opportunities such as such as mine sites. Um, very briefly on, uh, on, on, on my mining experience, it's somewhat limited, um, so I will uh, uh, let me just get this to go. That'll work. Um, and so this is basically my mining experience limitation is I've worked on a mine site for a year and uh, my grandfather is Alvin Lynch. Um, and it's really a fantastic opportunity to, to, to speak with you all today. I think it's kind of in the tradition of, of grandpa is that I was sort of nominated by another family member to speak. So Susie, thanks for the nomination, um, which you sort of can't say no to. Um, anyway, so what I kind of want to look at is what typically someone in this place will tell you about the renewable energy transition and I kind of want to talk, sort of unpick that a little bit and sort of talk through some of the real challenges that we are facing in the energy transition that I think are often not communicated. So this is probably what most people in mining, when someone comes to this kind of talk, starts with. There's some breathless enthusiasm for the opportunity regarding critical minerals, regarding mining um, for, for the energy transition. And then you look at the headlines, and this isn't exactly what's happening in the, the battery industry at the moment for minerals. Now, part of that is geopolitics, absolutely everything. Number one rule is energy is geopolitics and geopolitics is energy. Um, but part of it too is, is what I would say is a over-reliance on kind of financial extrapolation on current trends as opposed to a really granular understanding of what is going on and some of the challenges in it. And so often you'll see not only this sort of massive growth rate in, in you know, 42 times current mineral production like that, that's an that does make you question, is this even possible, really, from a mining background? I was like, that, that's, that's a pretty substantial growth rate in a short period of time for a somewhat mature commodity. Um, and then you'll sort of see this graph. This is from BP's Energy Outlook from 2023. You see three scenarios, all broadly quite attractive, you know, not lovely declining growth rate. Well, there's some spread between them, but, you know, we're definitely going to be going down. Um, and then you sort of see these sorts of charts where we have in wind and solar, um, and you see sort of a classic, oh, we're a little bit now, but definitely there's going to be a very high penetration of wind and solar capacity in the grid. And, and, and more broadly, um, we see light vehicles and we see electrification of light vehicles. We see um, hydrogen and electrification of heavy and medium vehicles. Um, this is all pretty standard stuff. Um, we then do a sort of congratulatory moment where we talk about the growth of investment over the last 20 years and look how big it is now. This is such a meaningful sector. Um, and all those things. So 
that's kind of a trip for a typical uh, you know stump speech if you like on the renewable energy transition and how how kind of inevitable or inexorable um, the, the change is. I want to stop there and sort of think about those those numbers and kind of put them in a slightly different visualization um, to see to see what that looks like. So this is the historical trend data of CO two emissions, um, and this is the amount of budget that we have left in order to meet Paris targets. Um, now, past performance isn't a reliable indicator of future performance, but looking at the historical trend line, you could imagine some reduction. But we are talking a substantial and significant change in order to achieve. Um, this 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 decarbonisation. This isn't something where it's just a lo lovely steady growth rate of different technologies and commodities. This is a significant transition. I think the joke for me is, it's, or the kind of motivation for me is, it's the story of you know my career and and, and this sort of period of time. Um, but we have to take into account this is pretty significant, and we are already starting to see impact of of weather and uh, and things like that. In addition, as this transition occurs. We are going from one technology class to another in a substantial way that a lot of the markets weren't designed for. They were designed for incremental change. And certainly we don't really have a clear view of when things become economic. And so what you're starting to see is coal um, closures are being pushed out, but we're not really clear what's replacing them. And so we're ending up with a more unreliable grid. If anyone's been in Victoria over the last few weeks, you would have experienced that. Um, the coal assets are aging and we're working them more harder than we used to. Um, and so we're going to have a world really that is going to be higher energy prices, much more volatility um, and, and really some quite challenging and then also much more significant weather events. And obviously weather has quite an impact on, on power. Um, not least a large number of the developing world is in um, hot climates. So air conditioning loads are substantially increasing. Um, now let's put the exponential growth rates into some context. Um, yes, solar and wind are doing phenomenal jobs growing. But the reality is the number one energy source that has grown over the last 10 years was natural gas. Solar, wind and hydropower combined were less than the growth in natural gas. Part of that is because most of the world's engineering, especially energy engineers, are focused on the oil and gas sector. Um, and actually very, there's actually relatively limited engineering capacity in the um, uh, renewable space. Um, in addition, it's just a hard problem. Uh, this is a substantial shift in, 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 in physics, and it's also a substantial shift in markets and, and, and things like that. Um, and the other thing people often ask me is, why do you still work in solar? You know, isn't this a solved problem? And I look at this and say, there's still quite a lot of opportunity here in this space. Um, I think the number is we're somewhere around a terawatt of installed solar the kind of future projections mean we need about 70 terawatts and we need to have installed that in the next kind of 30 years or so. Um, so, you know, we've installed one terawatt in the last 20 and we need to do seven, 69 terawatts remaining um, uh, by in the next 30 years. Um, this is true at the Australian level as well. So uh, this is the Australian energy consumption. Um, the black is obviously coal, oil, gas. Um, the shaded bars are forecasts. Um, those forecasts are probably out of date. The coal use is not coming off as quickly as many of us had hoped. Um, and then the two red lines, um, that represents all of the solar and wind that have been added uh, in the last 10 years. Um, so that's sort of putting the energy transition into some context. This is a phenomenal result, like bringing a new technology, set of new technology classes online is, is incredible. However, we have a long way to go. Um, and I think... If you start looking at those BP curves, outlook curves from earlier, you will realise just how low the base is that um, that they're growing from. And, you know, they might, they might continue to accelerate, S-curve adoption, all of those things. But there is also a risk that, you know, nuclear grew at a certain pace and then stopped. Hydropower, similarly, there's, there have been technology classes that have been introduced that have grown but did not end up taking on the full mantle that they were expected of. Um, so that's kind of the broad picture. Now, I understand some of these things aren't, perfect correlations. Um, oil and gas is often less efficient consumption than a, than a solar panel. That said, when you start adding batteries, you'll have to move the batteries around. So there are some inefficiencies. So yes, I understand those, 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 those challenges. Um, what I'm now going to do is talk a little bit about the grid and solar on the grid. This is what I know really well. It's my, my day job is, is, is understanding this space. Um, what I would also say is for those looking at decarbonizing mining, that is a very similar problem to decarbonizing the grid. And in fact, mine sites often have it harder earlier because if you think about a mine site, it might have a 30 megawatt baseload 
for 24 seven power load. Um, that's actually uh, quite a challenging load to meet with renewable energy and we'll go into that. But certainly we're also seeing the same challenges at a macro grid scale as you may also see at a micro grid scale. Um, uh, so, so let's just talk about the grid. Um, globally, the proportion of coal on the grid is about the same as it was 20 years ago. Um, so it was 38% in 1998 and it was 38% in 2017. Um, the quote that is, uh, we have stood still, perfectly still for the past 20 years. Um, now, there has been growth as we talked about in solar and wind. The reality is um, that we've actually lost some net zero fuels, including, including nuclear, um, and we've sort of shifted away from hydropower as the main source, partly due to water availability. So um, the the non-fuel fossil fuel, everything's basically the same proportion as it was 20 years ago. Um, in Australia, Australia is actually one of the leading markets globally. Uh, it is one of the, na the nations that is leading the most. It is actually behind certain regions. So California is much more adopted. But in terms of solar penetration, Australia is one of the world leaders, especially at the national level. Um, and you can kind of see the, uh, the electricity mix in gigawatt hours. So this is the production output of different sources. You can still see we're quite dependent on black and brown coal, roughly um, some order of magnitude of uh, a majority of energy consumption in, 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 20, in 2016, 2015, 2016. Um, and you can sort of see the solar and wind penetration increasing. So we're now somewhere around a quarter of the grid or a third of the grid is powered by renewable sources. Noting that we started with about 10%, 10, 15% coming from um, Snowy Hydro and Tasmanian Hydro. Um, look at their target. So the target for the electricity sector in Australia is um, 82% um, by 2030. Uh, and that means we need to grow solar and wind from, say, 20% to about 70%. Um, uh, and it won't surprise you that after those targets were set, um, we're now starting to see the reality dawn on us um, that those targets are fairly impractical at this point without really changing how markets work, how the geographies work, um, and how we think about the energy transition. Um, and so, in fact, 2023, last year, was the worst year on record since about 2017 is when we started counting these things, of projects reaching financial close at the utility scale. So it was the worst year for solar financing, the worst year for wind financing. There was some good news out of batteries. Reality is most of those projects were pretty heavily government financed. Um, so in fact, whilst we need to be going right up the curve in terms of growing adoption of renewable penetration, we're actually starting to see the opposite in terms of adoption. And that is a true statement. So when you look at, Globally across grids, you do typically see this kind of rapid ramp up and then a drop off. So typically you will see utility solar installations shown as a beautiful exponential growth curve um, of cumulative capacity. When you break that out, it's almost all China. Um, China is absolutely dominating utility solar installation. More than one in two of every panel globally is being installed in China. Um, people often talk to me about Elon Musk being the great savior of the world. To be honest, if you look at the numbers, um, Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping is the most adopting of um, solar and wind uh, by some by some enormous measure. Um, and that's true. Uh, effectively, most of the reason solar prices have reduced is because we've used less polysilicon. So they used to be an inch thick back in the 70s. They're now a few microns thick, the amount of polysilicon in the solar panel. And the other reason is because of enormous investment by the Chinese state enterprise into um, silicon panel manufacturing. Um, without that investment, we certainly wouldn't have the prices we have today. Um, and they have it's been continued. So now solar panel manufacturing, wind panel, wind manufacturing, and batteries are kind of core to the um, Chinese engine uh, economic engine. So if you think about the economic recovery, it's moving away from property and infrastructure and moving into batteries and solar panels and electric cars. Um, it's at this point where uh, the economics are hard to model um, because it becomes a geopolitical question. Um, so I'm not going to pretend that I can make massive uh, expectations around those markets and those decisions. But know that to a large extent, the energy transition has been driven and remains driven out of China. Um, now, I have been in the US recently. There's the IRA. The reality is the issues that are in Australia are the same issues in the US. It's not really a problem of financing. Um, there is a lot of green capital that exists that want to invest in solar and wind. The biggest issue is we don't have places to put it and we've saturated the time of day when solar and wind um, are typically exporting power. 
And so the problem isn't necessarily about money. It's actually about how we structure and wire our network and where we put storage. Um, so what you're seeing here, right, is effectively this kind of bump that you saw in Australia where it went up and then went down. That's pretty common. Um, it's not exponential. And so if you normalize the growth, um, you do see this sort of up and down growth. And the only reason it's exponential is because we're getting larger grids are getting into solar. Um, and so China is obviously an enormous grid, I think it's the world's largest, but also the US East, which includes Florida all the way to New York and parts of um, uh, the Midwest, um, that is also a, uh, uh, a growing market opportunity. Um, Okay, so that's uh, how we sort of think about the energy transition. If you break it down even more and you look at it versus solar penetration versus utility sale adoption, we have what we've coined at our workplace, a solar ceiling, um, which is that basically as you continue to add solar, the solar penetration is the share of the grid. You get to a point where everything looks great. There's this massive investment into the sector. Um, all of these projects reach financial close and everyone starts building them. Um, and then all of a sudden you get a glut. And whilst the interconnection queue, so the number of projects in development continues to grow exponentially, the number of projects reaching financial close drops off a cliff or, or, or solar ceiling. Um, and so what you see is a rapid slowdown of utility scale financing at the same time as you've um, continued to see development growth. And so what happens, calls for the government to intervene grow um, substantially. And that's why you start seeing programs like the US Inflation Reduction Act or the Australian um, Capacity Investment Scheme. Um, it's sort of the only lever we have in the energy industry once we kind of reach saturation. And as I've kind of presented in a moment, it's not really the solution we need. We need a technology solution. We need engineers uh, to come into this process. Um, so uh, let's now look at the, what, why this happens. Why does this problem happen? Now, note I'm talking utility scale solar. Um, rooftop often continues because rooftop is a non-economic decision. It's basically a massive subsidy um, to households. Um, in fact, it is good when you take power to consume um, you know, devices, but the price you are getting paid for exporting solar electricity is substantially higher than the value of that electricity. You are basically heating wires. Um, the grid was not designed to take power from households up into trans substations and then shift it to other substations where it's needed. It just doesn't work backwards. And so any electricity that you have either goes to your immediate neighbours, but if they all have solar, it just goes to um, changing the voltage and heating up um, uh, poles and wires. Um, but we pay five cents a kilowatt hour because it's uh, politically expedient to do so. Um, and so... This is at utility scale. This is what we're starting to see. So this is the market shift in the Australian context um, from 2018 through to 2022. This is the average interday, intraday pricing. Um, now, you saw earlier when we started to hit that peak of utility scale solar, um, rooftop solar continues unabated. Um, and what you see is effectively uh, pretty flat, some price spiking, oftentimes Morning and evening are when people are consuming power. That's always been traditionally true. If you think about your journey to work today, you probably may have run the dishwasher in the morning and you may come home, cook at night, um, turn on the air conditioning. Um, and, and so your loads are generally early morning and then evening. That's a pretty true statement. Um, uh, and then what happens is that load profile continues, but all of a sudden we've massively saturated the middle of the day with electricity. Um, enormous amounts of electricity, part of which is caused by those big solar farms at utility scale in, in regional areas, but a lot of it is driven by rooftop. Um, and so you then see massive um, dips in the middle of the day. But worse, you actually start seeing really big price spikes in the early evening. And that is because we don't really have the technology that's able to ramp extraordinarily quickly to uh, meet those price spikes. And so you're often, often gas is the price setter, open cycle gas turbines are the price setter or um, coal. Um, and coal kind of ramping at that rate, um, it kind of doesn't like it. So they, they price it pretty aggressively in order to, to make that work. Um, now, many of you will look at this and go, that makes sense. That means there's a market opportunity. Surely the market will solve this problem. And the answer to that is it has, but not in the way you think. Um, the way we've actually solved this problem at the Australian level right now is we're cycling coal plants in a way we never planned to um, and they were never built for. Uh, and so you can see enormous cyclings. This is going from roughly six to seven gigawatts to 12 gigawatts. 
uh, which is an increase, uh, a six gigawatt swing, um, and it's about an eight hour duration. Um, and so that's a pretty substantial swing on a, on, a, on a coal plant. These are the black coal plants. The brown coal plants in Victoria are older and are harder to do, so not as, not as um, robust to this. Um, this, however, uh, does have impact on the plant life um, and does also have impact on reliability. So if anyone saw what happened in Victoria, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but there was an unreliability event at Loyang. Um, but there was also Kali C here not too long ago where the, um, uh, the plant blew up and, and thankfully um, no, no, no one lost their lives. But this is kind of an unreliable situation, especially as these plants were built in the 70s and 80s and weren't designed for this sort of duty. So it's, this is what is weirdly keeping the lights on is this kind of swing of, of coal plants today. Um, Many will go, okay, but this is a great opportunity for batteries. Why aren't batteries taking advantage of this? Uh, batteries are really expensive. Uh, and the vision of battery prices dramatically falling in cost has not been realized. Um, now, because of the over, what I would say is people see batteries as more like computer chips where there's some sort of Moore's law applied. I would tend to argue it's more like a cost curve like a classic industrial cost curve for the price of a steel or price of copper, where it's massively set by uh, uh, supply and demand. And the marginal mine site is really setting the price. Basically, a battery is a combination of lots of different minerals, um, and those minerals really set the price for batteries. So I do expect this number to fluctuate down and then fluctuate back up as supply and demand both come online. Um, and so what we're seeing... A year ago was um, a, a real imbalance where there was too much demand and not enough supply. We've now built all the electric cars. The electric cars aren't as attractive as people hoped. And so there's now an inventory oversupply. And so we're seeing a collapse down in battery prices. I expect that kind of yo-yo to continue for quite some time. Um, but you do see that the forecast have got, has crept up quite materially um, between where it was supposed to be in 2030 and where it is today. Um, and these predictions are actually the basis of the Australian grid, the main grid modelling process. So if you get these wrong, and this was a curve that I remember having quite some views on, this 2019-2020 uh, forecast, um, what happened was they described it as a mature technology and then there would be a dramatic growth curve and then it would become a mature technology again. And it just so happened to be right when we needed lots of batteries to be installed when the prices started to fall. So I call that wish casting, where it's like not really tied to um, uh, what's what's the underlying happening. Um, I'll go into battery cost if we can, and we have a bit of time, but, I, but I'll keep moving. Um, all right, so let's talk about the coal assets. Basically, the coal assets are acting now as a 24 uh, gigawatt hour battery. Uh, rough maths looking at this chart. Um, and the, all, the operational battery capacity today is somewhere in the order of one and a half gigawatt hours, two gigawatt hours. Um, so you probably need about 24 times current installed battery capacity in order to do the current cycling that coal plants are doing. Um, that's not enough to get the coal off the grid. That's just enough to stop the coal plants from cycling today. If we need to get the coal off the grid, we will need much more battery capacity, much more hours of duration. Uh, and then the problem with that is we are only looking at it from a daily perspective, daily shifting perspective. Uh, problem then becomes uh, if we de-average the daily profile, um, we need much greater than a few hours. So if I do a daily profile of solar and wind in Texas, this is the shape of it. It's actually quite a good shape. You can see quite a good correlation, inverse correlation between solar and wind. It's a very good resource. You like this kind of thing, high capacity factor of the solar, high capacity factor of the wind. Um, at a few hours of batteries and you know, we've created a profile. Um, unfortunately, the world isn't like that. Um, and if you actually look at the annual profile, it's a lot more choppy. And you see certain periods of the year where there is almost no renewable energy. Uh, in fact, this is the 2021 year. And this February, if you remember that cold snap in February uh, where Ted Cruz went to Cancun, some of you may remember that from uh, and his dog was left behind. Um, that is that period there. Uh, and unfortunately, that was a really terrible event. Power prices spiked, people couldn't get power and it was freezing, so people died. And so like this is the problem in the sector is not only do we need a few hours, a lot of battery capacity to shift these, these day to night problems, we then also need a lot of surplus capacity in the grid in order to meet 
these periods, uh, the Germans call it Duncan Flaupe, where there's no wind and no solar. Um, but you also have situations where there's a lot of wind and a lot of solar, a lot of solar and a lot of wind. And so kind of managing these transient effects is, is quite challenging. I will also go into that this is the time shifting problem. There is also a place shifting problem. I'll go into that in a moment. But this is the time shifting problem. We have to time shift renewable energy from when it is being generated to when it is needed. And that means both in the day, but also throughout the week and then throughout the year and then across years. Uh, and if we look at the capital cost, uh, that doesn't really work with the current technologies that we have. Um, and so this would be, many of you may have done some analysis. We get asked a lot to do economic analysis for mine sites and off grid locations to see the power price uh, to meet power. Um, the issue is that battery costs um, are almost linear with duration. And so it's like batteries are really good for a few hours to shift a few hours, but the moment you need to shift a few days or survive a week, the battery cost has kind of gone up linear with hours. Um, and so become really, really, really expensive. Um, it is cheaper to pair solar and wind and battery together. It is always, renewable energy is always the cheapest power source when it is being generated. That's a generally true principle now. Um, however, it is not necessarily true that renewable energy is the cheapest power source 24-7. Um, in fact, there are, it isn't really clear what is because most of the things that are being built aren't being built. Um, and so you can talk about a hypothetical coal plant, you can talk about a hypothetical nuclear plant, or pretty much the only new capacity other than this in, in the Australian context is open cycle gas turbines um, and, and to some extent pump hydro. Um, and so the issue is the green power costs as you go towards 100% capacity factor, capacity factor being base load, so the number of times per year you're using it. As you push to that maximum, the prices will go up. And note, this isn't like, uh, it's not like it was $250 at 80% and then this last 90% is $500. No, the entire price to, in order to meet 90% goes to $500 a megawatt hour. Um, so it's really, really expensive to do this last little bit. And then you go, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll back it up with a fossil fuel source. Problem there is the less you utilize a fossil fuel source, the more expensive that system is. Um, so you install an open cycle gas turbine, or you'll need a, some way of getting gas to the location. So maybe that's a pipeline. Um, then you'll need access to the, um, the resource. Um, if I am not using that pipeline, that resource, and that turbine very much, that's a very expensive solution. Um, so a lot of times it's diesel, but even then diesel has the same problem. And so what we struggle with is when we're sort of communicating these problems to, to clients, it becomes a kind of how much do you want question. And many people aren't expecting that, where it's like you need to kind of draw a line somewhere on this curve and work out what is attractive for you and what you can adopt. Um, I would say Goldfields, the, the miner in WA, is doing a phenomenal job of understanding this problem and is probably one of the world leaders in installing solar and wind um, on, on site and then working out ways to um, integrate that technology with the existing baseload uh, diesel gen sets and other things. So um, really credit to them. Um, what I would say is briefly on rage, and one of the things we do is long duration energy storage. So our curve goes a lot flatter for a lot longer. Um, and that's sort of why I know this chart pretty well is, is that's our value proposition. Um, uh, so well, everybody's biased in this industry and that's my bias. Uh, so that was part one. Problem number one is time shifting renewable energy. Problem number two is place shifting renewable energy. Uh, would you believe that in almost probably over 90% of grid modeling studies assume that intra-regional transfer of power is entirely frictionless. This is a great graph from a Tesla version of this analysis that's called the master plan part three, uh, but pretty much every agency from McKinsey, d &V, GL, to various arena studies, um, apart from the AMISP that doesn't do this, but most of them assume that the grid is frictionless. And the only constraints they include are what I would call inter-regional constraints. So if we think of the Australian context, we have several markets, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, that are all connected. Imagine that you assume anywhere in Queensland, power can be generated and consumed without cost, but the only cost is to balance between New South Wales and Queensland. Immediately, that substantially undervalues the problem. If anyone pays their power bill and looks at it, Cost to connect to your property is probably about half of your bill, if not more. Transmission and distribution, so poles and wires, both in the big poles and wires and the small ones outside your house, 
are an enormous part, enormous cost of the energy grid. How are you not modeling it in future modeling studies? But this is extremely common. The reason is because it's really hard to model transmission constraints. It suddenly becomes not a time shifting problem that you can solve in a mixed integer linear program um, on Python, a few hours of work. It suddenly becomes a nodal study and nodal studies are extremely complex um, traveling salesman problem kind of thing. So that's why they don't do it, it's hard to do. Reality is if we think about the energy transition, there's kind of three aspects to it. Cheap generation, cheap storage and cheap transmission. If we are trying to solve for, if we ignore one of them, then the costs are going to go blow out in that model. It's effectively a tripart problem. We need to optimize all three. If we assume that one is frictionless, um, then, then we've massively going to in, overinvest in that capacity. Let me talk more specifically about Australia. Uh, I'm going to use the New South Wales map because it's a little bit better than the Queensland one because it fits a bit neater on the page. Um, but you can appreciate that Queensland has this problem as does everyone else. The history of the energy grid is it started off as a set of um, independent companies that were selling to different suburbs. Um, governments in the early 20s and 30s consolidated that into state-based power systems. Um, John Monash did this for the State Electricity Commission in Victoria. Uh, and then what happened is we found large energy deposits, mine sites, coal sites, um, around you know, Bowen Basin, Hunter Valley and Latrobe Valley um, and other places as well. And we built enormous power generating systems at those locations as close as we could to those resources. And then we built big transmission lines into the cities. Um, and you will see that in the graph. You probably can't see it in this map, but broadly put, the really big black lines, which are your 500 kV lines, um, they are going from Hunter Valley to Sydney, Latrobe Valley into Melbourne, um, not quite in Queensland, but uh, Bowen Mason into, in, into Brisbane. And then obviously we have a, a smelter over here. So we have a 500 kV line going all the way to the smelter. Um, now that, that works. And then you go, okay, what I need to do is I need to go and connect the regional communities. And so you build small power lines out to the regional communities, but you design those power lines to bring power to a city of Mildura, which is 30,000 people, not designed to bring power from six to 6 million people on a smelter. And so our entire grid is massive transmission around the city areas, but then quite limited into the regions. Uh, and what then happened? Well, then we've all started to fractionalize, you know, smaller and smaller um, lots. You know, the cities have grown. Um, there's the weekend doctors who bought uh, farming properties in, in regional areas. And so you have uh, a much higher density of population in the areas where we have transmission lines. Um, and so it is a difficult problem to propose putting um, wind and solar in those regions because there's a lot of community pushback. Um, the second challenge is they're not the best places to put the wind and the solar. Um, the best places to put solar are behind the Great Divide. Um, so let's go back here. Um, and so realistically, anywhere uh, west of the Great Divide on the East Coast is where you want to be putting solar and probably more north as well. So in Victoria, that means a lot of clustering around Mildura. In New South Wales, it's orange um, and, and places like that. And then Queensland's actually got a lot of solar generation sort of north of Townsville uh, as well. Um, that makes sense. You've got all this available capacity. I'll just plug in. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, then you massively create these uh, problems in the middle of the day um, where you have all of the solar being generated in a regional area where there is no load. Um, and so whenever anyone does this analysis and says, well, electric vehicles are going to solve the problem because they're a dramatic storage, they're not in the regional area. They're in the cities. So what you are doing is massively increasing load in the cities, but you aren't commensurately increasing um, load in the uh, where, where, where we're putting these large systems. The other issue being that transmission is really expensive. Solar is quite infrequent, as is wind. So wind capacity factors on, on land are about 30 to 50%, maybe a bit more. Solar is typically 20, 30, 35% at best. Um, that means that if I'm installing a transmission line to a solar area, I'm underutilizing that transmission capacity um, by about a factor of 70, 75%, um, which is a really inefficient use of capital. Uh, and this is partly why the transmission lines aren't necessarily getting built. Part of it is community pushback. Um, Part of it is also the cost and, and the inefficiency of it. Um, and then wind is also an issue for that reason as well. So not only do we need large amounts of storage to time shift renewable energy when the renewable energy isn't there, we also need large amounts of um, to 
place shift renewable energy. Um, now, for those that are driving the EVs, I'll get to that in a moment, the electric cars. But another thing to think about is that most people today are charging their electric cars in the evening because we frankly don't have charge infrastructure to office blocks um, for people to park their car and charge it. And so that's a great idea. But then what we're really going to be doing is building enormous transmission lines either within a city or from the regional area into the office block park in order to charge the cars. And so whilst it works in theory, it isn't currently working in practice. Um, and there are some pretty practical reasons um, why that isn't working. Um, and the worst part is uh, that's true pretty well around the world because most people like to live, have historically lived where there is rain because rain creates population centres. The problem is rain is cloud, therefore cuts the value of solar. And so most solar areas have very limited population. Most of that population exists along uh, river systems and other water irrigation, um, which means that you have very thin areas that are close to transmission lines where you can install solar. Uh, and so that becomes a challenge with solar is you don't look at a map of Australia and say anywhere on this map solar can go. The reality is solar has to be about 10 to 30 kilometres from a transmission line. Um, so think of the market for solar and where it can go today as a thin ribbon sitting either side of a transmission line. And that's part of the reason why communities are really pushing back against transmission lines, because transmission lines imply a change of use of land from existing to a different thing, which is solar. And many promises have been made, but I think the industry hasn't quite delivered. So um, that's part of the, the reason for the pushback is you build a transmission line, anyone either side of that transmission line is either going to be um, given a lot of money to, to put solar in, or is going to be a neighbor to a solar farm. Uh, and that's part of the challenge. So that's the grid and the problems with the grid. Uh, and sort of looking at time, uh, one last little bit, because I think that the other feature would be, um, I want to kind of end on a positive note, but I'm going to go via uh, uh, a little bit of a challenge. The, the next point you probably see is those enormous graphs on minerals and things like that. Reality is electric cars are heavier than conventional cars generally. That difference is predominantly driven by the lithium ion batteries. Uh, this becomes an issue as the duty of the vehicle increases. So a payload of most cars is like an average adult um, because that's the number one car, light car vehicle use is, is commuting. Um, the payload for um, you know, a, a truck, suddenly I need to not only have the battery to power the truck, but I also need the battery to power the battery and carry the battery. So I kind of have that rocket ship problem where the more energy I put in, the more I come out. Um, that means I, I don't know enough about electric electrified haul trucks. So you guys might be close to that experience, um, but I do question that problem. Um, how much weight is in an electric haul truck and what are we doing about it to, to, to measure it? Um, the other issue with electric cars is there's a lot more minerals in them. Um, that might be a good thing for mining, um, but reality is it means that you are uh, quite more cost uh, in, the cost of the vehicle is now tied to kind of the variable supply and pricing of, of these components, um, which just makes, sometimes that'll be good and sometimes it won't be. Um, the other feature is electric car break even on a CO2 basis is actually pretty poor. So many have, may have been around a barbecue where someone says something like, you know, a solar panel, it takes 20 years to pay off the energy. Um, that's wrong. That, that's not true. It's about two years. It used to probably be about 20 years, 30 years ago when solar pillars, policy looking was 30, um, was an inch thick. It's now a few microns thick. Um, it's about a two year payback. Wind's about the same. Um, electric cars today don't have that luxury. They are actually quite a long payback. And it depends a lot on the power source. So if, and this is a comparison by Polestar versus the XC40. So two equivalent SUV vehicles. If I'm powering my car using entirely green power, in this case, wind, um, it's a 50,000 kilometer use. Noting that the electric car lifetime, as according to Polestar, is about 200,000 kilometers. So effectively, I, get, um, I do get a payoff uh, for the remaining three quarters of the car's life. Uh, but if I'm charging just directly onto the European grid or the global electricity grid, it's about 100,000 kilometers. So I need to have used the car about half of its life before I can have paid it back. In the Australian context, it's worse than this. Our grid is actually quite dirty as a proportion. So if you are plugging your electric vehicle in at nighttime, it may not pay itself back over its entire life. Um, and that's just something to think about is how am I using my electric vehicle and, and that sort of thing. Now, here's the hope I want to end on. 
e-bikes. And I know I'm like a, the millennial in me is, is coming out. <laughs> this is the modal shift that I think most people aren't talking about. E-bikes offer a dramatic change in performance versus bikes. Dramatic, right? Like you arrive less sweaty, you can go further, you can get there faster. Um, that's not true. The e-car versus car, they're about the same experience. Like one can accelerate a lot faster and there's some differences in range and, and things like that. But largely it's a similar experience. Ever ridden an e cargo e-bike? You can do your weekly shopping. You can carry three to four kids. These are phenomenal things for, for, for a shift in modality and they are dramatically less energy dense. Um, and so I think the thing we're talking about the least and one that I want to finish on is the e-bikes uh, revolution. So e-bikes are growing faster than e-cars. They have reduced oil by 60% more than e-cars globally. Um, they are outselling e-cars in the US. They are outselling all cars in Europe. Um, demographics is density, a destiny. The world is getting older. Retirees typically drive less. Um, young people in the US are driving at a rate dramatically less than they were 20, 30 years ago. So it used to be 80% of 18 year olds had a driver's license. Now it's less than 60%. Um, California, famous for loving cars, is now decommissioning freeways, or there's calls to decommission freeways in San Diego. So a lot of what we are talking about in terms of this modality is really a Californian driven export of what the world should look like and i think if you actually look at the world it's starting to sort of reject that notion and it's starting to do different things um, and finally e-bikes are cheaper um, faster to scale and less material dense one e-bike can one car can make 50 to 400 e-bikes um, 50 percent of all trips in the united states are less than three miles so whilst you might keep your old sort of internal combustion engine just use it less Use it for that one trip every week and then use your e-car for the commute, use your e-car for the grocery. Um, and then new e-bike infrastructure can be added at 300 times the uh, efficiency of typical car infrastructure. So adding freeways, it's about 300 times uh, the cost uh, or one 300 the cost. And that doesn't take into account the enormous amount of investment we'll need to make e-cars work because of the transmission investments and power loads. So sort of a note to end on, if you do want something positive, this is a really positive story, I think, in, in, in a sea of, um, of challenges. Um, if you look at it, why isn't the IEA modelling a world with um, massive adoption of e-bikes? Because that's actually occurring, that is now more likely than massive adoption of e-cars. Um, so on that note, I will finish and open up the questions. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Will. Um, I'm actually also considering buying a, an electric scooter, but the, I think the challenge here in Brisbane is this freaking hills everywhere. So, so maybe this is a, a better better choice. Um, are there any questions for, for Will? Yes. Just a real quick one on, the, on your last note. What's the cost of a bike? Um, What's the cost of e-bikes compared to a car? Uh, yeah, it's about a tenth. So a good cargo bike today is somewhere in the order of $5,000 to $7,000 fully installed. Um, an e-bike, an e-car, BYD is probably the cheapest, probably at $50,000. And Tesla's going to be $70,000 plus. Probably, I'm, I'm not actually a massive car buyer, so I don't know. Um, I, the other thing you should do is get public transport. So I actually live really close to work, so that's my main um, mode of commuting. But um, yeah, it's about a it's about a ten. So the reason for adoption is often cost. And then maybe to your point, Christy, one of the reasons I think we underappreciate this shift is one of the reasons people didn't adopt bikes is because of concerns about being too hot, too sweaty, arriving at work, having to ride the hills. If you add like a 30 kilogram load in, the, in your back, gee, that's going to be pretty hard on those hills. Um, and they'd be pretty fit. Whereas e-bikes e basically solve a lot of the friction points that exist for adoption of, of um, lighter infrastructure modality. And so that's why I think it's so it can be a more driven thing. Plus you can park an extra train line very easily and you can plug into other, other transport systems. And there's Q&A online, so I'm not... Uh, a, a, a couple of questions. The first one I don't need an answer for, but the, you said the Germans had a name for when there was no wind and no solar. I wonder what we will call that in Australia. Um, oh, bugger. Sort of. <laughs> thought we were gonna... <laughs> um, uh, my question was, you, you spoke about project, 
<clears throat> projects to fully financing in terms of being built. Um, I was listening the other day, uh, I think it was just yesterday on the news about the time it takes to approve projects. So never mind finance them. And obviously approval is a key part. And they were saying between two to 10 years to approve, for example, in, in New South Wales, where two years might have been um, um, perhaps for uh, solar, but 10 years for some wind. Is is that a bigger delay than financing, the way that approvals build into the project uh, pipeline? Yeah, I think it's a... I think there's a lot of problems in the transition that I can't kind of cover in this moment. And I think to some extent permitting is definitely a significant issue, but I think often seen as the cause of the problem rather than just one of many problems. Um, I would say that clearly planning takes too long. There's a number of people are better experienced than I am talking about that. Um, it is, however, a social license question. And I think the rush to install a lot of technology happened in a way that left a lot of companies bankrupt, uh, left a lot of communities with feeling the wrong way and not really appreciated. Um, and the challenge of where you put these things, typically you need to put them near to existing communities because that's where the transmission exists. And so part of the problem is we haven't really thought through the implication of building enormous amount, like where are we putting the renewable energy as part of this? Where are we incentivizing renewable energy to go? And then how are we bringing those communities along? Um, I think is part of it. The other feature would be there's another concern called grid connections. And I didn't really go into system strength because system strength is a very niche topic. But one of the reasons grid connections are taking so long is because we've kind of been using the grid as an energy bank. So when we have, when solar farms have a little, basically solar farms don't, and wind don't generate in controlled outlets. They, they sort of fluctuate up and down. Um, and so the advantage is you, it's low cost. The disadvantage is you have, the, the grid is built on stable linear steps in five minute increments. And so if you're kind of promoting to go from here to here and you kind of wiggle between the two, that wiggle, you're just kind of assuming the grid is taking on the responsibility of managing the, the intermittency. We come to the point where the grid can no longer accept new solar, particularly because of it's it's so destabilising to have all of this solar in certain areas. Um, and so part of the problem with grid connection is you're basically having to put a proposal saying, we really think this one won't quite break the grid. And, and I think we need to think quite differently around the technologies that we're bringing around synchronous generation and around um, inertia and other technologies in order to make this work. But doing that at a solar farm level means the solar farm becomes uneconomic. Um, and so again, not only is the grid, not only are there kind of time shifting and place shifting problems, but there's also like plug-in problems. How do we make it all kind of sync together? Because we didn't design the grid for the technologies that we have. And some of the conversations around grid forming inverters are a little bit um, perhaps oversimplistic. And the other feature is it's just not that many electrical power engineers in Australia. And all of them that used to work at our EMO, especially the really good ones, are now private consultants that get you know, charged a million bucks an hour and because there's only a few of them. And so we, we, if you think about where are all the engineers um, who can kind of help with these technical problems, they're here. They're in the oil and coal and gas industry. They're not actually in the wind and solar industry to some extent. And so how can we not only bring individuals across to the sector, but how can we bring entire companies across into the sector is a really important problem we have to solve. Um, otherwise, we just, just do not have enough technical competence. It's too much financial modelling, too many green products and financial products, not enough actual we need to solve this problem at a um, you know, brass tack level. Of, of, of cool, thanks. Are there more? Yeah, I'll just add um, that was a really great talk. It's one of the best talks I've ever heard on this topic. Uh, you need to get on a plane this afternoon, fly to Canberra, and give the talk to the individuals who infest Parliament House and who are in charge of our future energy, because the rubbish that comes out of that place is just abysmal. Um, uh, there was a report written, I'm sure you're aware of it, a year or so ago, Robin Batterham was involved in looking at, at the big problem of, that you've been talking about. And the, one of the figures that stood out that everybody uh, remembers is the cost 
for Australia to go to net zero and to solve these problems was one and a half trillion dollars. That's the size of the Australian economy. So it isn't going to happen. It can't. It can't happen along the lines that they proposed. So you you ended up on a little note of hope. With all due respect, e-bikes are not going to solve global warming, right? Uh, so it was a very pessimistic assessment of where we are. Um, engineers can generally solve anything, but where do you, if if we are going to solve this problem, where's the solution going to come from? There are, there are going to be many solutions. The transmission thing is a obviously a dominant problem, but but what do we have to do? to solve the problems that you so eloquently described. Thank you for the feedback. And um, I think to put the number in a context, I think we spend about six to $8 trillion a year globally on energy, energy infrastructure of all kinds, all of these different systems. Um, and we will predominantly just need to be shifting that investment across to green energy. It will be more investment, but, you know, the, the Australian economy is sort of $3 trillion a year. If you're looking at... Um, you know, 30 years of investment, you can kind of divide 1.5 trillion and it becomes a more manageable number. Um, the What would I say? I think the biggest frustration, personally, I work in a new type of technology, is the absolute lack of investment in different approaches to, to, to this problem. And the kind of almost sneering of, well, hydrogen or, well, why are we trying a new battery technology? We've got the technology. The number one quote I hear at renewable energy conferences, we have all the technologies we need. Uh, no, we don't. Uh, clearly, we don't. Um, we need to be investing. And then in the last sort of 15 years, we've basically outsourced almost all innovation to pretty much Californian-based VCs. And those VCs typically are um, one... Um, X PhD in some energy system, and then uh, you know a bunch of finance guys. And so, what what do they look for? They look for things that they can get fast market feedback from. And so, what works really well? Software as a service, I can sell that quickly and get market feedback. Or biotech, because there's a really good set of structured rules around getting a technology to uh, a, a medical procedure to market that I can get feedback from. Doesn't pass stage one, does phase two, phase three, etc. The problem with clean energy is there don't exist easily financeable market signals. And so you often see a real inefficiency in capital allocation to techno some technologies that are nowhere near ready enough, whereas other technologies that should be getting more capital, capital work. There's an entire gap around project finance. Um, that realistically, we've tried to solve using government programs that haven't worked. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the CFC is more likely to fund a um, industrial park with a solar panel and a battery than it is to fund an innovative technology. Um, and so we're in this kind of challenging environment where we're not really funding the tech. And then the companies that have the insight have kind of, to some extent, dealt themselves out previously. They said, look, the returns are too low. The uh, This isn't our wheelhouse. We don't understand it. We sell molecules and electrons. And so you, you sort of see where, where that kind of, institutionally exists it isn't there's, there's now growing momentum to shift into the space um but there hasn't been previously um and then also it's not quite clear who is the owner of this new world um so yes energy companies to some extent but their capability is in oil and gas and there are some there are some links into renewable energy but they aren't um a linear relationship and so and then you look at solar panel companies and wind farm, wind, wind, wind companies um they're often just you know, trying to keep up, stay afloat because the returns are quite low in the sector. So there's a real financial problem here of who is owning it, who is driving it, how are we not leading it? And I think that is a, is, is a core problem in the sector. Um, I know people sort of hear me do these talks and they sort of think I'm like a dementor, you know, I snap all the hope out. But quite honestly, I don't know about you, but I look at these and go, I don't really know where we're getting the hope from. Um, so uh, I'm hopeful in like a technical sense, like it is a solvable problem if we start massively investing in a lot of ideas and we start bringing structure into how we're investing them and we start bringing technical capability earlier on into the development journey. Um, and, you know, companies like Mindsight begin to experiment and it isn't just a, oh, we need a greater than 12% IRR in order to, to do this experimentation. We just do experimentation and we see what works. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a challenging problem. Um. Uh, I found uh, what you were saying about rooftop solar fascinating and, and its impact on the grid. Um, do you think there's scope 
for building, say, more battery capacity in the cities to to use that excess power and store it locally. And, I mean, if there isn't scope, it, it obviously hasn't happened apart from some households putting in batteries here and there, power walls and that. Um, but if not, then what's kind of, what's the barrier to it at the moment from either a commercial or a government um, take up? Uh, the, the number one commercial barrier is battery costs are really high. So if you go to a solar panel installer, it'll be a payback of some single digit number of years. I think it's like solar hot water is under a year, solar PV is a few years and a battery payback is probably the life of the battery at this point. Um, and so that's a challenging sales pitch. Um, my general view is to simplify the problem to some extent, if you do want to model transmission, the easiest thing to do is to suggest that um, sort of theory of constraints, process optimization for many of you doing process optimizations of a chemical process, whatever is the most expensive unit of that system, have the smallest capacity of that and highest utilization. And so the transmission line is probably the most expensive capacity, therefore put large amounts of storage in the regional area with the renewable energy, and then have large amounts of storage with the customer to flatten their load. Um, and yeah, adding solar and wind, and, solar panels and batteries to the household is a good idea. It is, however, somewhat inefficient um, because of the capital cost of doing all these small systems. It's also um, true only for the developed world. Uh, the developing world is not going to be able, I don't know if you've sort of seen the spaghetti lines in a developing nation, but it doesn't have the safety and institutional rigour and um, commercial rigor in order to roll out like a rooftop solar and battery program. And in fact, how China does it is they actually tender solar panel and battery installations at, at a regional or national level. And then one company is tasked with installing them. And then that's how they kind of manage safety and risk and, and adoption. So it is a challenging problem to bring solar and batteries into households. That said, it's, it's a good thing. Get, get some on your roof if you can use the power. That's great. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just sort of saying that it's a, it's a somewhat oversimplified panacea. Cool. Um, Candice, is it okay if we cut it off here? We're just okay. running out of time, but you're welcome to have a chat um, with Will afterwards. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, let's give another hand of applause to Will. And also, sorry for the questions online. Um, please feel free to reach out to Will with your questions afterwards. Um, so for next week, we have Nadia Kunz from the University of British Columbia. She will be talking about um, mitigating mine water and waste legacies through interdisciplinary approaches. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. And you're welcome to have some tea and biscuits outside and chat, chat with, with Will. <laughs>